Welcome to the Empire Files podcast. I'm Abby Martin. Today I'm happy to talk to my friend and colleague Paul J. Paul is a journalist and filmmaker who's had a long career in media. He used to host a primetime debate show on CBC News called Counterspin. He's produced several award-winning documentaries, and he created The Real News Network, where he was a primary host. Paul was also instrumental in helping the Empire Files launch in collaboration with Telesur as our executive producer for our debut season. I always appreciate Paul's insight and analysis, which you can get all the time at his new site, theanalysis.news, which hosts all of his interviews and commentary. Paul, thank you so much for joining me on the Empire Files podcast. Thanks very much, Abby. So let's start by talking about Afghanistan. Because we're recording this shortly after Biden gave his final talk about the official end to the war, now that the last plane with military personnel has finally left, uh, what's your reaction to his speech? Well, uh, I mean, he, he was, if you want to talk about him as an individual in this situation, he was caught in, between a rock and a hard place, uh, so you really have to give the context of how we got here, uh, and you know, it, it's, and it's somewhat a false debate. Um, you know, his argument is <clears throat> if he had pulled the, uh, all the uh, Americans and Afghans out more gradually earlier, uh, it would have sent the message to the Taliban that the uh, uh, that it was only a matter of time, quickly, that the Afghan army would fold. And so they delayed pulling out for those reasons because they thought it would speed up the demise of the Afghan army. And right. so it's, you know, within the context of that moment and the decision making he had to make, I suppose it's as reasonable as anything else. But for progressive people, for workers, for us to talk about the situation, the question for us isn't whether it was a chaotic evacuation. Uh, you know, could they? Could he have left in a different way or better way or whatever? Uh, you know, I used to produce this uh, debate show on CBC in Canada called Counterspin. And right after the first in, uh, invasion of Afghanistan after 9-11, um, the Canadian media was all in a tizzy about whether Canadians... Uh, troops should have armored vehicles or not. And were they, there's a big debate about what equipment they're taking with them. Well, we did a debate which, which was about, well, if you're really serious about democracy in Afghanistan, why the hell are you aligned with warlords? I mean, isn't that the debate? Like, can you build democracy mm -hmm. if, if you're aligned with warlords? And, and in fact, and I'll give credit to this guy. Uh, he's, he's one of the foreign correspondents for CNN based out of London. And I wish I could remember his name because he deserves a little bit of credit. Because he's the, about the only one in mainstream media that I've heard make the point that the overwhelming demand of the Afghans after the fall of the Taliban was if you're going to invade, okay, disarm the Northern Alliance. Disarm the warlords. If you are, have any seriousness whatsoever about uh, democracy and modernization and so on, and, and let's remember there was a sort of democracy in Afghanistan years before all of this. Uh, we can get into that. Uh, but if you're serious, start with disarming these criminals, nor the Northern Alliance criminals. Well, of course, we know far from doing that. The Americans showed up, the CIA showed up with suitcases full of cash, uh, gave it to the Northern Alliance to buy them their cooperation in demolishing the Taliban. Um, and, and so the fundamental objective of the United States was never anything to do uh, with democracy or, or uh, the, the interests of the Afghan people. And of course, this has all played itself out over the years, I mean, the closest, the rhetoric, well, there's two moments of rhetoric, which I, I, the first one was kind of funny. I don't know if anybody remembers this, but me, 
But George Bush went on television not long after the invasion of Afghanistan and asked all the children of America to donate one dollar to a fund to help Afghan children. What? I, I, for the life of me, have been trying to find out what happened to that money. Because I'm sure a bunch of kids actually what did the send their dollars. Fuck. Really? You can look it up. Uh, I mean, it's, <laughs> you know, it was all part of this. We're going to help the people of Afghanistan. And, and, and this, this is a yes. group effort. Everyone in the country needs to pitch in, <laughs> including the kids. Yeah, really. <laughs> yeah, the American government can't afford to help Afghan kids. Uh, <clears throat> Now, as you know, I was there making a film called Return to Canada. But I want to get into that. I want to get into that. Um, what was the other point yeah. of rhetoric really quick before we get into uh, this backstory? Well, when, Obama, when Obama had his troop surge, he said he called for a civilian surge. He said, it's not enough. It, we can't do this with just troop surge. There has to be a civilian surge of engineers, of teachers, of doctors. You know, we have to you know, seriously commit to helping the Afghan people. And there, of course, that was, if, if you're going to be there and you have any seriousness about the objectives you're stating, well, of course, that is what was needed, far more than any troop surge. And of course, that was just a bunch of rhetoric, too, because there never was a civilian surge. Right. Yeah, I mean, he, he said a lot in his speech, a lot of just kind of empty, baseless rhetoric. But I think that uh, an important aspect of it was this rhetorical question that he asked, Paul. He said, I respectfully suggest you ask yourself this question. And he asked this to the press corps as well, which was bizarre because a couple days ago he was like re-asking the press this question. And they were just like, why are you asking us questions? But anyway, he said, if we'd been attacked on September 11th, 2001 from Yemen instead of Afghanistan, we would have gone to war in Yemen. Um... Or, he, or he's basically like, would we have gone to war in Afghanistan, even though the Taliban controlled Afghanistan in the year 2001? I believe the honest answer is no. That's because we have no vital interest in Afghanistan other than to prevent an attack on America's homeland and our friends. We both know that that is completely false, Paul. Um, you, one only has to look back at the Clinton administration and the nuisance that the, that the Taliban was causing. It was a very unreliable business partner. There was plans for the Unical pipeline. You even see headlines from CNN today basically begging someone to go and extract the mineral wealth because, quote unquote, the world needs it and we can't afford to have the Taliban be in charge. Then you have him, you know, of course, it wouldn't be a, a speech if they didn't talk about China. Um, he definitely kind of hints to the Asia pivot, how we need to pull out of Afghanistan because we need to focus on al-Shabaab you know, other countries in Africa and, of course, China and Russia. Uh, what I thought was also interesting is just pointing out that the war cost $300 million a day. Okay, horrible. So where else is this money going to go if now we're going to be saving $300 million a day? And then, of course, closing out with this horrific drone strike that wiped out an entire family was, you know, reasserting that this was indeed legitimate because it did target ISIS. So if you want to comment on any of that, uh, before we go back a little bit to your film, Return to Kandahar, I mean, you were in Afghanistan about a year after the U.S. invasion in 2002. So let's talk about what the country was like when you were there, Paul, and if you wanted to comment on anything else. Well, well I'm not so sure. In fact, I, I don't know that there's evidence that the United States uh, and would have been the Bush administration at that point would have invaded Afghanistan anyway without a terrorist attack. Um, I, the Bush administration actually, as far as I can tell from all the evidence and interviews and whatever, actually didn't really even want to go into Afghanistan even after the attack. There, the plan was always the invasion of Iraq. And Afghanistan was, was a distraction that they had to do because American public opinion, at least in their eyes, uh, demanded retribution. It demanded revenge. Wait, 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 wait. They wait. Could, Really? Because there was even documentation yeah. that said the Taliban was fully going to surrender if we gave them amnesty, and they said no. I mean, there was complete hubris of the situation. Yeah, because they I, well, it wasn't just if the if the Taliban um, surrendered, were they saying no? 
Um, part of that deal was, uh, and, and I actually interviewed a, when I was in Afghanistan, a member of this, who was a, at the time a member of the Taliban Central Council, was the handing over of bin Laden was part of the deal. Yeah. And, and in fact, the, in the first vote, uh, Mullah Omar called the vote, and the Taliban, according to this guy, and I, I believe him to be serious, uh, we interviewed him in Wally Karzai's house. He was, he was a real former member of the Taliban Central Council, according to everything we could find. And, and there is some reporting from the uh, Guardian and the Independent that verified what I'm about to say. Uh, the Taliban Central Council voted to hand over bin Laden. Um, they, they, uh, even though Mullah Omar was against it, uh, the majority thought that Al Qaeda had misused, misappropriated the uh, friendship and the ability of Al Qaeda to organize in Afghanistan. Um, and according to this guy, a lot of them were concerned about how close Mullah Omar had become with bin Laden and Al Qaeda. And, uh, and so they actually had a vote, and, and, the, and the vote was hand them over to an Islamic country and let, uh, let a trial take place within an Islamic country. And I don't know if that would have been Saudi Arabia, which would have been ironic given the Saudi role in 9-11, but at any rate. Um, so, so according to this interview, and it's in the film, uh, he... A few days after they vote to hand over bin Laden, um, there's a, another meeting. Mullah Omar calls a second meeting of the, of the uh, Central Council or whatever it was called. And at the meeting is, according to this guy, was the Pakistani foreign minister. Um, I kind of wonder if, it, if something didn't get lost in the translation, because I think it'd be more likely to be the, somebody from the Pakistan. Any secret service, the ISI. But at any rate, according to him, some senior member of the Pakistani government was at the meeting and argued against handing over bin Laden and said, you, you know, he was a guest. He was a mar these are martyrs. They fought, you know, against the uh, Russians for you. Um, and, you know, you cannot turn him over to the Americans. And so there's a new vote and they voted now not to turn him over. And there was a deal where bin Laden was going to leave uh, with the support of Mullah Omar. And in fact, this guy talked about seeing uh, dozens and dozens of white SUVs uh, pulling out one morning, uh, which raises another question, which is if it was so damn obvious, others would have seen it, too. But, but just to get to your point, um, uh, I... I there was, I, I, I mean, I remember very clearly those days, the, the public opinion, at, and much of it generated by the press, uh, is, is they wanted an invasion. They want, there, there was, and when I say public opinion, this is the, the, a public opinion the media creates, and, and certainly the elites create, and, and I, I, you know, sections of the military-industrial complex. Yeah, but aren't, sure. you, aren't you giving, aren't you letting bin, the Bush administration off the hook a little bit by being like, this was all manufactured by the press and then public opinion mounted and then forced their hand well, to invade because Afghanistan? You, all, the, all, the liter, all the literature, everything you read, from Gates' memoirs, from people I've interviewed, from Wilkerson's, from others, they wanted to invade Iraq. That was the agenda from day one of the Bush administration. Uh, they never had an agenda to do anything but invade Iraq. And, uh, and according to uh, Bob Graham, Senator Bob Graham, who was head of the uh, Senate, chair of the Senate Intelligence Committee and co-chair of the congressional investigation into 9-11, he explicitly told me on camera on several occasions that Bush Cheney deliberately, in a planned way, allowed 9-11 to take place as part of a plan to invade Iraq, and even went beyond a passive wall, and we can get into that. According to Graham, uh, there was actually some proactive measures taken by the Bush administration to facilitate the 9/11 attack. But it was always about Iraq, uh, and I don't, I don't, I don't, I see no evidence that they wanted to go into Afghanistan until after 9/11, and then they, and and then when they went, they didn't go in a serious way. And in an interesting way, uh, this is why I say when the white SUVs all left Kandahar, you know, why weren't they bombed? 
Well, uh, well, Bin Laden, well, it's very documented that Bin Laden was allowed to leave the country. This is well, that's that's my point. Yeah, yeah, no, of course. So, but so, but so, that doesn't make sense. I mean, but but you have to admit that there are vital interests in Afghanistan. No, uh, y- yes, and no. I, I don't. If there were really vital interests, they wouldn't pull out. Uh, but they wouldn't have no, been they, there they, for they, twenty years trying to make it a neo colony. What was the point? Well, 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 why did the United States stay in Vietnam for so many years? Even though Same it was reason. clear that the war, well, because Johnson stuck his dick out and said, we can't be seen to lose. Uh, you know, there gets to a point where they know, it's like the Pentagon Papers made it clear they knew they were going to lose in Vietnam. They knew they couldn't colonize Vietnam. And they stayed there for years afterwards, with millions of millions of deaths. But that, you could almost argue, was made more sense because they couldn't let communism win as like a precedent to be set. To me, it's not the same in that respect. But for the sake of brevity, let's accept your premise that they did not. Well, I, let me just finish yeah, the point here. Sure. <laughs> once, once, they're, once they're in, they can't be seen to lose a war, even though since World War II, they lose war after war. But they can't, you know, if, 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 if you look at Brzezinski and chessboard and why he thought they had to suck the Soviet Union into Afghanistan and, and, and why they have to uh, pr- project power in the region, you can't be seen to lose to the Taliban. You, it makes you look weak. At least that's what's in their brains. And, and, this, and Vietnam was about that. You know, there's this story that's pretty documented in the White House where someone says to Johnson, you know, it's clear, you know, this, you know we're going to be there for years and this isn't going to go, we're not going to win. Why are we still here? And literally, Johnson whips out his dick and holds it in front of them and says, because we don't lose, we got the biggest dicks. I mean, you know, you can't underestimate the role of banality and stupidity in the making of history. Oh, no, I, I and, don't. I and, just, and, 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 yeah. No, I don't. So, I think that we also lost the war in Iraq, but for some reason it wasn't the same as Afghanistan. I mean, I think that there was a lot of motivations, Paul, instead of just the imperial hubris and belligerence on, on behalf of military generals just being like, we can't afford to look like we've lost this thing. I agree. Like one of the things that was a strategic asset, and I, you know, this story has to come out more, is you know, you're talking about the biggest producer of uh, poppies, uh, heroin and such in the world, the, the massive amounts of uh, money being generated there. And there's just no way that you, you export industrial amounts of poppy without the American armed forces knowing about it. And the CIA well, especially because the it. NSA has been fully documenting every phone call. It, one of a couple countries in the entire world was Afghanistan. Full surveillance of all phone calls. Yeah. And you're telling me that the CIA did not oversee this operation. I think that we're going to be finding out a lot more about the opium harvesting and where this all went, Paul, later on. Hopefully yeah. someone does and of course, investigate and, and of course. That. The, the mineral wealth, especially lithium, but it, but it's, that's not enough reason to fight to keep what looks obviously was a losing hand uh, for for two decades in Afghanistan. And I think the reason it changes now uh, with the Biden administration and why they're getting out now, and to some extent it was the same equation for Trump, and a lot of the same people are advising both of these presidents, is China. It's all about every every foreign policy decision now is they sit down and say, how does this impact us with China? And their their conclusion here was they're tied down in, in a terrible war and it's and it's uh, it weakens them in terms of China. Now you can, they could argue the other way. Once you leave, it makes you look even weaker. And now China has openings in Afghanistan, but it had those openings anyway. Mm hmm. I mean, I I do think that the U.S. was chomping at the bit to have just a reason, I think, that to invade Afghanistan. Of course, the main prize was Iraq. We all know that. That was explicitly documented through their plans, Paul. But, um, but let's move on. Um, you were in Afghanistan, which is incredible. I mean, you were there a year after the U.S. invasion. That's pretty crazy. Well, less, 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 less than a year. Less than a year after the U.S. invasion, I guess, in what, early or spring yeah. 2002? Well, the invasion or... was, 
Yeah, well, the invasion was what, like uh, like October, late, two- late, yeah, yeah, October, November, and I, we were there in June. Jesus. So it was for your film Return to Kandahar. This was not a documentary. This was a uh, no, it was a documentary. It was a documentary. So this this woman was a real figure who was trying to find her friend. Yeah, what oh, happened wow. is Nelifer Pazira, um, she was the, uh, there's a film called Kandahar, which was a fictional film made by an Iranian filmmaker, Maklabuf. And she plays a character in the movie based on her story, but it's not the real story. In that movie, uh, she goes back looking for her sister or something or another like that. So I, she was living in Toronto and uh, I, she was a guest on Counterspin. I had her on and I got to know her. And when I heard the real story that her friend, uh, Diana, had sent her a letter uh, during, I guess around, this would be, when did we go, 2000, 2001, she gets a letter from her friend Diana who says she cannot bear living under the Taliban rule. She's confined to her house. She can't work. She can't go to school. And she ends the letter by saying, you'll have to live for both of us now. That's sad. And every, you know, the, you know, interpretation was, her, Nellifer's interpretation and others was that she was going to commit suicide. Mm. But she never could find out what really happened to her. And, and so I, I said, well, let's go find her. Let's let that be the documentary. We'll go look for Deanna. And we'll use that kind of as a motif to tell the story of how Afghanistan got to where it is, which, you know, the years of civil war and the Americans arming of the jihadists. Well, uh, so on. Briefly explain that. Briefly explain through her, through the lens of, of this film, like the potential that Afghanistan had before the Soviet invasion, before the, the dirty war versus the war ravaged impoverished nation that we all know today. Well, when when you can this is scenes in the film when in the early eighties and such when Nellifer was going to high school, um, all, all the girls wore blue jeans. Um, she said if someone showed up in a burqa at her high school, they'd be laughed out of school. Burqas were things that people from the villages would wear when they came, you know, to a market in Kabul. Uh, nobody in Kabul would dress that way. Uh, the, the other thing, and John Pilger has actually written a good piece recently about this period, which is worth looking up. Uh, the governments that came to power after there was a coup against the uh, cousin of the king who was ruling, who had himself had a coup against his brother, the king. Um, so in the early 80s, before the, this thing starts, I, and I'm sorry, in the 70s, uh, the, there was real modernization going on. In fact, the, uh, the coup, which was fairly popular, was organized by the Afghan Communist Party, um, which, which, according to Pilger's article, and he has some pretty good documentation, was not a puppet party for the Soviet Union um, and was part of a sort of domestic, uh, organic, urban Afghan politics. Um, and when they came into power um, they got rid of this cousin of the king that apparently was quite hated and then they developed reforms um, and the reforms uh, of of the most important ones I guess given what's been happening is all girls were entitled to go to school all women were entitled to go to work and the uh, and, and, and while in the urban centers that was already the norm the countryside was very futile and very backward, and you know women had no rights at all. And and this communist government, social, quasi communist, quasi socialist government, uh, started to impose these laws in the countryside. And you can argue they did it in a very authoritarian, very bureaucratic way, instead of trying to persuade. Uh, elders and villagers and and create a process where the women could fight themselves they imposed it on the countryside and it gave rise to a lot of rebellion and the uh, elders uh, you know obviously the men uh, started fighting against this government and that's when Brzezinski 
advises Carter to start arming these uh, village fighters that became known as the Mujahideen uh, against the government. Uh, the, the, it was allied with the Soviet Union, but there's some serious differences too between the Afghan Communist Party and the Soviet Union. But at any rate, to shorten this up, um, once the uh, Mujahideen start getting American arms, uh, including um, st Stinger missiles where they can shoot down helicopters, and, uh, the, it starts to become a question whether the uh, Afghan government can sustain itself. And the, the Soviets actually don't like the way the Afghan government's operating, especially these kind of more coercive ways of imposing these reforms. Yeah, I'm, I, I, and I'm sure there's people that know this history better than me, but this is a broad outline. So the, the uh, Afghan communist government asked the Soviets to come in and because the Americans were so interfering, uh, arming uh, both the Mujahideen, sending cash and arms through Pakistan. It was all being managed by the Pakistani ISI. The Saudis were helping finance and organize it. Um, and uh, and this, you know, long story short, eventually the uh, Soviets have had enough. The way now the Americans have had enough, and the Soviets withdraw. The Afghan government lasts a few more months. It actually lasted longer then than this one did now. <laughs> and 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 the Tal Nelifer describes that when the um, Taliban marched into uh, Kabul, they were seen as heroes. You know, people saw them because they, the Soviet government had become, at, at least this is her take now. You know, there, I'm sure there were, like her uncle was very pro-communist. Mm -hmm. So so it's not as simple as her take on this. Her take was that the uh, Soviet, the, the Afghan communists and then the Soviets had been so repressive and bureaucratic in the way they ruled, even though it was great for women and education, literacy went up, you know, it was, the Soviets, I think, were there eight, nine years. A lot of progressive developments took place. At any rate, the people that had had enough with the Soviet occupation in the cities, and certainly those in the countryside that hated the reforms. So the Taliban come in, with, as you're reading in the press now, a lot of the same promises. Oh, there'll be women's will have right, women will have rights, and this and that. Anyway, Nelifer, and this is in the film, or she talks about it, they escape Afghanistan and go to a refugee camp in Pakistan. And it turns out the refugee camp is actually run by an extension of the Taliban. And so she gets a, a direct experience of what it meant to live under the Taliban. And she, she completely changes her mind to see the Taliban as a positive force and so on. And they eventually she gets to Canada. Mm -hmm. Anyway, to jump forward, we head off in the spring of 2002 looking for Deanna. The, the situation is the Taliban have more or less left the country for Pakistan. Al Qaeda, you know, the Tora Bora thing's over, and they're in 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 in, in, in Pakistan. And I got to tell you, as as much as I was opposed at the time to the U.S. bombing and the U.S. intervention. And, and I, I, I supported those people that argued that if there really was evidence that Al-Qaeda in Afghanistan was responsible for the 9-11 attacks, and I'm at least convinced they were. I have not seen serious evidence they weren't. I believe they were. And I, in, in Afghanistan, I was told they were, including this guy from the Afghan Central Council. But it could have been done like a police operation. And in fact, from what I know, they even could have worked out a deal with the Taliban to get al-Qaeda. But at that point, I think the last thing the United States wanted was a show trial with bin Laden. Uh, he's, he was very, you should read bin Laden's letter to the Americans if you haven't. Uh, it's brilliantly written. He, you know, oh, he says, yeah, you no, say, I was going to say that everything that bin Laden's written is actually really worth checking out because a lot of it's the whole, why do they hate us? They hate us because of our foreign policy, especially when it comes to the U.S. support of Israel. 
you know, and Bin Laden certainly articulates that in every, almost every speech. Yeah, he has a great line. He says, if we, if we hated you because of your freedom, we would have attacked Sweden. <laughs> Which is, I think it's a wonderful line. You know? if, freedom, if your style of freedom is the problem, <laughs> we should have attacked Sweden. <laughs> it's unbelievable, honestly. It's un- and then you see people yeah, like Tulsi so- Gabbard really quickly. Tul- Tulsi Gabbard had this r- really dumb take on the whole thing, being like the ISIS case suicide bombing was because they they want us to convert to their version of Islam. And it's like, no, that's not why this happened. But go ahead. So I when I got there to Kabul and I went with all my preconceived notions of how much I opposed the the way the Americans number one uh, bombed and invaded uh, allowed the Northern Alliance to come in. I heard from so many people, and uh, we went all over the country. Kabul. Uh, we went down to Kandahar. We went north to Mazar Sharif. Over and over again, I heard number one such hatred for the Taliban, such relief that they were gone. And such hope, number one, as I said earlier, that the warlords would get disarmed. Number one demand. Number two, are the Americans and NATO, are they really serious about reconstruction? Because if they are, then of course we would welcome it. And there was a a kind of optimism that, that, well, as bad as the bombing of Kabul was, and as bad as so many people died in those attacks by the U.S., were do- at least the Taliban are gone, and now there's some kind of hope. Well, when we were there, we could see it already by the spring of 2002. The U.S. had absolutely no interest in reconstruction whatsoever. The U.S. troops were chasing the Taliban and Al-Qaeda around mountains and borders. And, and who, honestly, I don't, it's not clear what the hell they were doing. You know, they would do strikes that would kill people in weddings. But who would do it when you actually saw where there were attempts at reconstruction, like a building of a school, building of a hospital? It was always Germany or Canada or Norway. The U.S. said, you know, you NATO countries, you go do the reconstruction stuff. Well, we're not into the reconstruction business, which means it never had real money behind it. It never had real force. And the whole U.S. line now, oh, we failed at nation building. Bullshit. There wasn't a day they attempted nation building. They destroyed the, the nation, and that isn't you know, 20 years ago, they, they destroyed the, the process of destruction of Afghanistan is, is back to Brzezinski and Carter and then Reagan and the, and the arming of jihadists. That's the beginning of the destruction of Afghanistan. But, but there, when there actually was a moment where if there was any seriousness in the rhetoric, Afghans would have welcomed it. And there wasn't. It was all BS. I mean, it. It's really sad to hear you articulate that because I don't blame them for having hope and optimism for what they thought the U.S. really was trying to do. And and unfortunately, Paul, that was so soon after the invasion, I would imagine that if you were to speak the majority of Afghans today, they would have a, a much different view on the legacy of the last 20 years. I mean, we don't need to go over the statistics here, but it is pretty pretty horrifying you know and i mean let's just look at who really reaped the profits here i mean two trillion dollars of taxpayer funds were just funneled into defense contractors you had over a hundred billion dollars in public subsidies not to mention that like you said the suitcases full of cash just handed over to the people that fled and now just the chaos which again all of this hubbubaloo over like the chaos and how the evacuations happening look ending the war is good objectively i think that we can all on the left agree with that um but yeah i mean it's pretty devastating the suicide bombing the fact that facts are coming out about soldiers unloading into the crowds in a panic the drone strike he promised in revenge that basically massacred this family 
I mean, there's so much that happened, and now there's hundreds of people left there, you know, not just the token Afghans that helped facilitate the occupation or the translators or whatever, the CIA assets. Now it's like, what, what is really going to happen to the people left behind? And now you have Biden, as you said, reasserting the Asia pivot and basically saying, look, we don't need boots on the ground anymore. We can strike terrorists and targets anywhere um, with our, quote, over the horizon capabilities. So what is your take on that kind of this this pivot and shift away from the concept of boots on the ground and now just saying, you know, the war on terror is going to continue, Paul, unabated? Well, why at this moment? They both in Trump and now Biden decided enough is enough. And they'd already gone down to, what, 2,500 troops or something. Yeah, it was basically very little. It it was kind of over. Um, I I think it has to be the way they see contention with China because it is about this grand uh, chessboard. I I just want to add one thing to this earlier conversation. While we may not agree, but I, I don't think there was a grand plan to invade Afghanistan. But I think once it takes place, everybody sees the money-making opportunities uh, in in such a in such a war, and and it's you know as you just said you know to at least two trillion uh, you know most of that gets paid to American companies and contractors, um, and the and the poppy trade and and, and so on. So I, I think it became a very. Uh, feeding frenzy of these sectors of the economy and and i and i it's reached a point now and i think in terms of their contention with china their logic is we're just tied down here we're spending money there for nothing and i think there's another piece to this logic of why get out now the same logic would have held earlier but i think there was too many people making money out of it nobody wanted to wear the defeat See, I, I wouldn't give Biden that much credit that he, he was willing to wear the defeat, and maybe because he knows he's not going to run for another term. But the other element here, which is why I think they can do this, is because they know who's going to manage the situation in Afghanistan, and that's going to be Saudi Arabia and Pakistan. And that's now Pakistan for them is a bit of a wild card uh, because of the influence of China. But the Saudis have enormous influence in Pakistan, I, I, as far as I understand it, more than the uh, Chinese do. And the Saudis are a fairly reliable uh, al- ally of the United States, uh, which is a whole other story to talk about. So, so the odds are that the Taliban will do stuff within the realm of what the, the Saudis and Pakistanis consider Okay, so it's not like they're just handing Afghanistan over just to the Taliban. The Taliban are, they're not puppets of, of the Pakistanis and the Saudis, but they're very, very close. Uh, now, I, that being said, Al-Qaeda is very influential in the Taliban too. So mm-hmm. it's, it, it's a very complex thing. The, but the... I don't know what was your question? Oh yeah, just about. Just, oh, well, what about now? Yeah, I mean, just the pivoting to like, or just or just the comments that you know we we don't need to do this kind of warfare because we have the drone war now. Well, it's you know? true. If they, if if you if you sit, they so Biden sits down at the table. They take power. His people are there, and they say, "Listen, what is the real foreign policy, geopolitical issue facing us?" And it's obvious the answer is China. So it means every single other subject, every area, every region, every decision, it, sh- it should be measured under the under that thing. Like any, if you're a corporation, you know, what do we do? We sell cell phones. Okay, well, let's not do something that doesn't help us sell cell phones. It, it, you know, that kind of focus, it's, it's a successful corporate mentality. And you don't just do everything because you can especially now when mm-hmm. for the first time in certainly maybe ever you're facing a rival that is going to have an economy or maybe already does but soon will have an economy bigger than yours that has a population that makes you look like a pygmy that has a, a global strategy is already the, uh, the you know the number one trading partner for most of Latin America, never mind Africa and Asia. 
um, you know, it's it, they're they're they've it's it started to bubble to the surface with Trump in its own perverse way, um, and even at the end of Obama, you had the beginning of the Asian pivot. That's Obama's stuff. So the the consciousness has arose arisen in the elites, in the geopolitical elites, that now they're facing a rival as never before. And, and the problem is they don't really know what to do about it. Um, this is not the rival of the Soviet Union, which they didn't like because so much of the uh, global economy, when you have a country the size of the Soviet Union, wasn't part of global capitalism. They didn't like that. They didn't like you know, even it was lukewarm sometimes. They didn't like whatever support the Soviet Union gave to national liberation movements. But still, it was never a threat militarily to the United States, even though they pretended it was. It was all bullshit. I mean, get in my Ellsberg thing later, but that's the essence of it. Um, but now there's a real thing. Now, let me, if I can, back mm -hmm. up for a minute here. To understand Afghanistan, you know, a lot of people are talking about Brzezinski and Carter and arming the jihadists to bring down the Soviet Union. But that isn't really the origin story of, of that phase of this kind of strategy. It begins at the end of World War II. And it's, it's FDR that makes the original deal with the devil. And that's when FDR meets with Ibn Saud of the Saudi royal family and makes a deal. And the deal is we will keep the Saudi royal family in power and you'll make life easy on Standard Oil, which had already started to understand how much oil, they were just starting to realize how much oil Saudi Arabia had. It hadn't even fully revealed itself, but Standard Oil had a pretty good idea. And they developed this strategy. The Saudi royal family will use Wahhabism and to expand its influence throughout the Arab world on behalf and in alliance with the United States. This actually gets articulated clearly under Eisenhower, where he actually, there's a quote from Eisenhower, which more, I may not get it exact, but it's pretty close. He more or less says, we can use the Saudi royal family and the fact they are the defenders of Mecca to bring down and oppose Nasserism, nationalism, and socialism. And let's remember, in all the big Arab countries, the communist parties were very strong. The socialist movements were very strong. So in order to oppose national, national liberation, nationalism, Arab nationalism, and socialism, the American strategy, beginning with Roosevelt, is a lie with monarchal fascists. And, and spread the most extreme, virulent form of Wahhabist religion to try to win the masses away from socialism and enforce very draconian regimes. So it's just, you know it's it's a, the line doesn't begin with arming Mujahideen in Afghanistan. The, the it begins with Roosevelt. And and, and let me just. To add one more thing. This isn't to demonize Roosevelt. It wouldn't have matter who the hell was president. The objective development, how global capitalism developed it, unevenly, you get at different times in history, certain countries become more dominant. World War II created, set the table for the rise of this American superpower. And when you think of yourselves, and of course, everyone likes to think of themselves as good guys. So, you know, Roosevelt sees himself and so do the rest of the presidents as, as the defenders of light, of, of enlightenment, of democracy against fascism and total, totalitarianism. And they, they set on this strategy, you know, after they've just bombed Hiroshima and Nagasaki <laughs> and firebombed civilians, right? The, the, these are the guys who think of themselves as enlightened. You know, I mean, the hypocrisy and, and is beyond, but what can you say? This is how the world works. They just see opportunities, and they take them. So there was an opportunity to ally and use the Saudis, so they did. And it goes on from there. The problem is this whole, the, the system of global capitalism 
and and the net, it's in the very nature of these big powers to expand and then run into each other. And now the U.S. and China are running into each other, and it's and, and it, it can't be more dangerous because of climate. You know, they're, they're not really focused on climate; they're way more focused on rivalry with China. Um, and maybe, in fact, from what I understand, China is actually more focused on climate than the Americans are, in spite of all the rhetoric. And uh, because of the crazy shit in the American uh, military industrial complex, and you should add financial complex, because most of the arms manufacturers are now owned by financial institutions. Um, they have this massive push now to spend a trillion dollars on modernizing the American nuclear force which is now pushing China to expand. Yeah. China was very modest up until now. Yeah. Now China's talking about expanding. A lot of this is in reaction to the U.S., whether it be Space Force or the modernization of the nuclear arsenal. A lot of it is done because the U.S. does something first, Paul. Uh, thank you so much for your time, Paul, for coming on the Empire uh, Thank podcast. you, Abby. Uh, really appreciate it. Everyone check it out, theanalysis.news. It's an incredible website. You definitely want to get on the mailing list and not miss a single interview that Paul is doing. Thank Thanks you, so Abby. Much, Paul.